of uh, of the of those people. It was a national news news uh, last December actually, just about a year ago. So there is even a blog item that I actually posted it. It's, it's horrible what is happening in the recruitment industry. Uh, really, this is modern day slavery. We ought to address that. Then the um, question of Nepal's poverty reduction and this whole issue of remittances being on product, used unproductively. Um, you know, I think we have to be very careful when saying something is productive and something is unproductive. I don't know who would say that, you know, food is productive and the television is not constructing a house is uh, not productive and um, um, I don't know, going to school is productive. I mean, I, I don't know how you sort of make the judgment what is productive or what is not. I think if a people had the money, they would use it for whatever purposes. For many of us, if you ask me, you shouldn't watch TV, I will say, you know, why are you telling me not to not to watch TV? Why you think that that's a bad thing? I mean, there is that, let it be, let, let people choose. And I really think that consumption is not bad at all uh, when you think about it from an economic point of view. For that matter, house investments in housing is not a, not a bad investment at all in countries like India, but there may not be any alternative way of property rights and investments um, that easily available. So I would uh, reserve my judgment about the unproductive use of remittances. And yet I quite buy the point about um, the hardship, pain that migration brings about, pain to the migrants themselves and that to the family, in particular to the children left behind. And in that context, the comment about, you know, the positive impact of remittances on private tuition or educational attainment sort of being to an extent uh, subtracted by not having supervision from adults, from parents, not having the love and care of the parents. I quite agree with that. Uh, I actually wrote a paper on Sri Lanka, analyzed the data on Sri Lanka, and Rajan actually published it in the first issue of Migration and Development. Thanks to Rajan for that where we found that remittances have stronger association with private tuition expenses in households that receive remittances. But, you know, uh, that might be a sampling problem or something. We can talk about that separately. But this also, kind, this kind of finding also has been uh, established in El Salvador and also in Mexico. Let me stop there, Peter. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dilip. And, um Thanks to the audience for the for the very fruitful questions. Now we're entering into a technical, um, technically very interesting point. Are we able to switch immediately from one speaker to the other? But let us give a great hand to Dilip for his um, intervention for this one. Thank you again, Thank you. and good night to Washington. <laughs> Thank you. Good night. And um, if the technical side is um, ready for us. We will switch to Binod Kadria. Hello, Binal Kadria, can you hear us? Yes, I can uh, hear you. I guess uh, this is Peter Bonin. Excellent, yes. And a couple of more people around who you apparently cannot see. You see what we see on the screen from our side. So, um, yes. welcome from New Delhi, from the Conference on Jobs for Development, and welcome to our session on migration and development. We were informed that you are like your um, predecessor speaking, Dili Brata from Washington, you are in the U.S. as well, right? Yes, I am uh, in the U.S. Uh, at the University of Wisconsin. And okay. um, unfortunately, my, I'll be arriving only uh, on the 3rd of December, which is a day after this concludes. Uh, uh, so I, I'm missing all the fun and all the interaction that you're having. 
but okay. uh, I must thank you and uh, other organizers for arranging this, uh, you know, Skype presentation. And All right, I was listening to, the, to your introductory comments and also the LIPS presentation. Yes, but we are happy that um, in your case we will have you with us throughout the um, rest of our panel. So, um, yes, we have already had some um, very interesting introduction on the practical side from German Development Corporation and then from Deliberata also combined with um, questions and answers on the more principal level about migration and development. And we are now very curious to hear from you a bit more the the specific side on um, migration and development related to India. Um, since, as it is, al is always about interesting subjects, we are running short in time. I take the liberty to remind you even beforehand about the very short time we have and to trying to stick you to your um, time limit here. But let's yeah. not um, miss any further time and please be not go ahead. Yes. Uh, well, uh, I will be having a PowerPoint presentation and, uh, you know, maybe I would skip some of the slides uh, to keep within time. Uh, do I have 15 minutes? Or yes, please. Time? 10 minutes would be... Let's agree on 10 minutes yes. and then we will I have more time for discussion. Excellent. I will, I will try to be as brief as possible. Um, so maybe I'll straight away go on to the PowerPoint presentation uh, and share the screen uh, so that you can uh, see the presentation. Um, can you see the presentation? Just a second, it's loading up. Here we are. Yes, excellent. Okay. So, um, well, I have given it a title called Jobs in India and Jobs Abroad. Uh, maybe I should have called it Jobs Abroad and Jobs in India. Can migration be turned into an engine of development? Uh, now, I need not give all the dimensions because Dilip has more or less covered uh, the, you know, the dimensions of migration and various aspects which are important, although his focus was mostly on remittances. Uh, this is uh, from the latest UN uh, documentation, uh, the status in 2013, the publication was 2014, and India's ranking in world migration levels and how the policies are changing. Uh, so India is number one with 14.2 million immigrants in the world total of 232. Um, and how many of them are in jobs abroad? That's the question I leave with, I leave you, leave the audience with. Um, India is number 12 with 5.3 million immigrants in the world total of 232 million migrants. Uh, Dilip did mention about South-South migration, so a large number of 5.3 million immigrants in India would be from uh, other developing countries, some of them our neighbors. and. Among, India is among top 18 immigration countries having policies either to maintain current levels of immigration or not intervening to influence immigration levels. That's out migration levels. And is amongst the 10 immigration countries having policies either to maintain current levels of immigration or not intervening to influence immigration levels. But India is the only country pursuing a policy of non-intervention in immigration, and that I think is a significant position. I would like to share this map uh, with the audience, which talks about 2020 scenario about glo global job surpluses and shortages. And if you look at, and I call it US confidence in jobs abroad for skilled workers from India, because this actually originated from the United States and later on India's planning commission did incorporate in the plan document. Now, you can see that India is 47, which is 47 million surplus workers in 2020. And then there are many others which also have surplus. If we add all those surpluses, then that would add to about 46 uh, million. So India 47, other surplus countries 46 million. And then the rest of them are deficit countries. The 
ones which have something like a dot uh, in front of the digit, but that's not a dot, that's a minus sign. And if we all add them up, that comes to about 53.5 million. So that seems to be the imagination of, of the scenario in 2020, India being one of the largest supplier of, uh, of, of, of skilled workers. Okay, uh, in 2020, European Union also uh, looking after, looking forward to India supplying. I'm not going to uh, spend time on these figures in terms of how United States receives most of the highly skilled and European Union receives most of the low skilled uh, migrants, but European Union also hopes to attract uh, high skilled migrants, about 20 million by 2020 through the blue card program. And I'm sure those who work with migration literature and migration discourse know what a blue card is. And now Asia Pacific, uh, Australia, New Zealand are major destinations. And now uh, they are being followed uh, by other countries like Singapore, Japan, Hong Kong, and so on. And the goals of all these countries are the same, to attract skilled workers from India and divert some of them away from the United States. Um, this is what is uh, reflecting India's own confidence. I think one of the uh, members in the audience had asked this question about India's demographic dividend, and that uh, Irudhya Rajan is present there, he's a demographer, he can tell you more about it. Uh, census 2001 and UN projection talks about India being the youngest you know, country in the world by 2020, till 2020, uh, 2050. Again, I'm not going to spend more time on this. Now, when we talk about, uh, you know, skilled workers, what we understand? I think uh, IT workers were mentioned, somebody mentioned about nurses also. If we look at the rightmost uh, uh, column, the green color, then you can see IT workers and teachers in the making, that students, you know, HRSTE, human resource in science and technology through education, and then you have the nurses, uh, which are there as high-skilled migrants. And then we have the low-skilled migrants down there. So I'm not going to spend time on this because this is time consuming. But the question that no one has asked is, uh, are they or would they all be Indian citizens, um, whether by birth, by descent, or by naturalization? And if we ask this question, um, we all know what the answer is. Uh, perhaps the answer would be, we don't know, we never thought about it. I'll come back to this question a little later, but for the moment, let me take the quantitative and qualitative issues for workers holding jobs in India. India's workforce that did not have either a diploma or a graduate degree, they're called the degree holders, uh, or also the non-HRSTE workforce, that is human resource in science and technology through education, uh, is estimated to be around 327 million in 2004. That is 89% of the country's workforce had an educational qualification of only high school or below. At the quantitative trajectory of jobs in India, we have these scenarios in 1981 census, 1991 census, 2004 uh, NCAER projections, and then we also had some from the NASCOM uh, McKinsey report uh, in 2005, which had projected what the scenario would be in 2010. And then we, when we think about post-2010 scenario, I'm yet to look at the 2011 census data, which are yet not fully available. So that is the scenario we have. And in quantitative terms, in 2004, as mentioned, only about one third uh, of the HRST were holding an ST, s and job. So these are called the core HRST in OECD terminology. That means somebody qualified at the third level, tertiary level of education is also holding a science and technology job. That is what it is. So only 35%, that is one third, were holding uh, relevant kind of jobs. If we take that these, these were 12% of them had such education in India, then only 4% of the relevant age, age group population we are holding such jobs. So uh, close to two thirds of uh, highly educated population in job are in the jobs outside the domain of HRSTO, that is 
human resource in science and technology by occupation. So, as a result, we conclude that there is a large-scale misemployment in India, often called the brain waste. 2010 scenario, uh, NASCOM uh, report also tells us that two industries, particularly IT and BPO, would need by 2010, that time is gone now, about 1 million additional skilled workers in five tier one cities. These were New Delhi, Bangalore, Hyderabad, Chennai, and Mumbai, and about 600,000 additional workers across other small towns in India. And qualitative mismatch that NASCOM particularly mentioned, and this is a well-known uh, quotation, that about 25% of technical graduates coming out of colleges in India uh, met the quality requirement of the offshore IT industry, only 25%. That means uh, one out of every four. And if we look at BPO industry, then from our general graduates, only 15% met uh, the requirement of that industry. So one out of every six or every seven. In contrast, if we look at the job profile of workers uh, who are holding jobs outside India in OECD countries, and uh, Dilip Pratha had mentioned about this, uh, you look at these three red colored columns then uh, we see these are the managers, the professionals, and the technicians, and uh, other, pro other you know, associate professionals. We do not have time. There is this breakup from uh, India Migration Report uh, of country-wise uh, data. But if we add them up, at the, if you go to the last, um, you know, last row, then you see that the three together add up to 140,000. 140,000 out of 340,000 are the highly skilled uh, workers which are of Indian origin in the OECD countries. It is not counting the United States. If we look at the United States in the next uh, slide, then in the year 2000, we see that out of, uh, you know, 100 uh, Indian workers uh, in the United States, 60 were in the, those professions, managerial, professional, and related occupations. Um, so the supply of human capital in India has presented a paradox of quantity and quality for jobs in India versus jobs abroad. High rate of graduate unemployment was prevalent, and I don't have to quote these figures. Uh, I think these are well-known figures. And such quantitative oversupply coexisted with high skill shortages in terms of the required quality. One reason has been that many of the high skilled workers from India holding jobs came from select Indian institutions. Uh, their brain drain from the IITs and the All India Institute of Medical Sciences are well known. These are government surveys conducted at different points in time for different batches of graduates. And you can see at the in the last uh, uh, row uh, that on an average about 25% of the IIT graduates have been working abroad. And they are the best ones in qualitative terms. If you look at All India Institute, the last uh, column, then they were 56%. That means uh, three out of every five uh, medical graduates were not in India. Now, this selectivity uh, continues in favor of high-skilled immigration of the last half century. And this is what I have quoted from the latest uh, UN uh, publication. And I'm not going to read it out because it will, uh, you know, take time. But just to mention that immigration policies are highly, highly selective across the countries. And if we look at high-skilled immigration versus overall immigration, then even countries which are trying to increase high-skilled immigration are not willing to increase overall immigration. So there is a trade-off between high-skill and low-skill immigrants. I'm not going to read out the statistics that is there. And this selectivity is reflected in evolving migration mechanism. Look at USA. Uh, this um, no to Bangalore, yes to Buffalo has been a very, very well-known quote from Obama's uh, election campaigns both times, uh, and it referred to jobs in India versus jobs uh, in the United States. European Union, the blue card is well known. I mean, how it has transformed from the fortress Europe. UK is very, very unstable and stricter norms for non-EU workers. Canada point system, Australia stricter PR norms, and New Zealand similarly. So we see the changes 
in immigration policies, how volatile these have been over time. And I, I just came across this uh, uh, November 21, 2014 uh, quotation from Obama. Are we a nation that educates the world's best and brightest in our universities only to send them home to create business in countries that compete against us? He asked, and then he said, or are we a nation that encourages them to stay and create jobs, businesses, and industries right here in America? This is highly reflective of the selectivity, and this selectivity is made dynamic and perpetual through temporary migration. So uh, if I may say so, uh, Peter, uh, now there is a replacement, there's some kind of substitution between temporary migration and permanent migration. Temporary migration is very much in fashion, and permanent migration is not very much encouraged. And we find that this is happening because, if, and I call it age, wage, and vintage, because in uh, most uh, developed countries there is aging, and so, you know, if the temporary migrants keep on changing, then their age profile remains younger, and that's to the advantage of keeping the population younger. And if the population is younger, uh, the workers are younger, their wages are low, their perks are low. If they are temporary, they don't get, get the pension. And that gives the, keeps the wages bill very, very low, and that gives a tremendous advantage in, in international trade for these countries. And finally, the vintage, where we look at the uh, primacy of student migration, uh, because they are future workers and they, they are also the carriers of the latest technologies. I do not have time to go into the details of what, uh, you know, technology alert list means, but these are considerations which are very, very obvious. Now, the challenge, because this uh, particular conference is about challenges and solutions. The, so the challenge here is that of low average labor productivity in India. These are slightly dated data. I'm sure researchers and younger researchers would find data which are more recent, but they would reflect the same story. If we look at the second column, this gives us labor productivity, which is measured in terms of gross domestic product per employee per hour in purchasing power parity US dollar terms. If we look at United States, then each American average worker contributes about 47 to 48 U.S. purchasing power parity dollars to the gross domestic product of the United States. And look at down India in red, uh, that is only $3.27, dollars, less than one hundredth uh, of that. And there are many other countries which are closer to United States uh, than to India. So that, I think, is a paradox in terms of Indians being highly productive abroad, highly contributing, uh, you know, uh, like the diaspora contribution to the countries of uh, their host countries, but look at the contrast in India about the average productivity of labor. It is very, very low. Binod, may so I remind you of yes? taking the time, please? Okay, I'll be short. Um, I will rush through uh, this, this caricature I want to share with you because this selectivity has been about 100 years old, and this I had taken from the United States uh, Immigration and Naturalization Service Statistical Yearbook of 1990. It shows that even in 1917, literacy was being introduced to stop the illiterate immigrants from com coming from India, China, Fiji, and other Asian countries. But if you look at the profile today, you will find that there is a contrast now. Most of the migrants that are coming to United States are very highly educated. Some of them are holding PhD degrees. So uh, in India, you know, what has happened in India was there was a brain drain was, at the, was recognized only in 1968 when Hargobind Khurana received the Nobel Prize in India uh, because she had left India uh, due to lack of a proper job. Uh, and this coincided with the 1968 implementation of the amendments of the U.S. immigration laws whereby they started, uh, you know, um, attracting highly skilled uh, workers from the developing countries, the uh, southern hemisphere. And if we look at that point, that was also the time when the IIT graduates had started going to United States because there was large scale unemployment in India and, and there was um, uh, this Sputnik race uh, between United States and 
Soviet Russia at that time, which required uh, engineers and scientists uh, to, to man the NASA laboratories. Solution. Can migration be turned into an engine of global development? Uh, if we look at Indian policy on Indians abroad, uh, I think we, are, we have come only to half circle, and I think Rudhya Rajan would uh, give you more details about this, how this has changed from uh, you know, a, a, a policy of indifference to do. Now, uh, a, a, you know, there is shaking of hands with the Indian diaspora. Prabhasi Bharti Divas is being celebrated on the 9th of January when, um, to mark the day when Mahatma Gandhi had returned from South India to India. We are talking about return migration a great deal in the literature now. Pinodian, Global, sorry uh, for on, pressing on so much. International migration uh, had emphasized that the distinction between skilled and unskilled migration is uh, a, a very, very impractical thing to do because all workers are essential workers. And so now we also need to look at uh, immigrant workers in India. I think uh, this was being mentioned. India has three kinds of immigrant workers holding jobs in India. Unskilled, low-skilled, regular, documented immigrants from countries of global south, in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Uh, Cross-border illegal, ir irregular, undocumented migrants from neighboring countries, particularly Bangladesh and Nepal. Of course, in Nepal, we do not have the numbers because you do not need visa to go to Nepal or to come back from Nepal here. And then we have refugees uh, from these countries, uh, which, although India is not a signatory, India does allow long-term visas and work permits for them. And these are some of the data about the foreigners in India. Since we do not have time, I'm not going to spend time on this. Uh, and these are the corridors, the migration corridors, global migration corridors. And you can see that uh, the second largest migration corridor in the world is Bangladesh, India, after Mexico, United States. Now, don't I would like to, to ask you to wrap up in a... Depth. Can we right. say we wrap up, you wrap up in about two minutes, simply to yes. have some more time for the other presenters? And I sure. hope the presentation can be made available for the participants as well, so it will be easier to read it, um, uh, the yes. interesting figures. Yes. Okay? So the low, uh, low level of average labor productivity that I mentioned, I think that is also uh, you know, being contributed to by large numbers of uh, immigrants in India who do not have uh, access to good education and good health. That is, I think, an important point. Um, now, India can go full circle and counter the asymmetry between jobs abroad for Indians and jobs in India for immigrants. India can initiate three major steps in this direction. Regulate the future flow of cross-border illegal and irregular immigration along the lines of the most other sovereign countries. Number two, regularize the past stock of cross-border illegal and irregular immigrants along the lines of some other sovereign countries because I think it is a wishful thinking to say that these people would be sent back to their countries of origin. Uh, four or five decades have passed by talking about these in the India's Northeast, but I don't think uh, any headway has been made in this regard. And finally, this is the most important one, turn the stock of immigrants to its advantage, to India's advantage, by building up their human capital through investment in education and health of these immigrants. This will maximize their productivity and optimize their contribution to India's gross domestic product. And if that happens, uh, Peter, this, is, this will not happen. That we, will, we thought that the you know, brain drain is slowing down, and because that may be slowing down because we are running out of brains. That should not happen and may not happen if there is investment in education and health of the immigrants from neighboring countries. To turn migration into an engine of global development would require sufficient condition, and that sufficient condition would be that we have to uh, not take decisions unilaterally, but also engage with the countries of origin and countries of destination. That, I think, is a challenging task, and I call that equitable adversary analysis, as opposed to the present practice of game theoretic hide-and-seek strategies of that origin and destination countries play against each other. The details of these strategies are beyond the scope of my presentation here. And so, Peter, with thanks, I 
end this presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pinot. And thank you for cutting things down, which are really long. And um, I, I hope we have more time to discuss um, some points of it. And let's immediately, without losing time, jump on to broaden the scope and opening the window to another case, the case of Sri Lanka. Bilesha Vera Ratne, please let us have your input. I think I'll start without waiting for Peter to sit so that we can save some time. Um, so all this time we were focusing on India, so let's move away from India to just get a little bit of an idea about what is happening in Sri Lanka, about migration and labor migration and development. So to give you a little bit of a background, uh, labor migration is not new to Sri Lanka. It started as early as the early 20th century where some Sri Lankans were sent to uh, sent to Malaysia as uh, plantation workers and also there was some sort of um, migration where the burger, Dutch origin burgers uh, migrated from Sri Lanka to Australia and New Zealand uh, for employment purposes and other purposes and also there was some um, mobility of high skilled workers from Sri Lanka up to 73 but that was limited numbers but the floodgates of migration started in Sri Lanka like in the late 70s when the economic liberalization program relaxed the travel and foreign exchange restrictions and also it coincided um, after the oil booms in the Gulf countries. So just to look at a few um, statistics in labor migration in Sri Lanka, as you can see it started off rather low in the early years but in 2013 there were 293,000 uh, 293, migrants leaving Sri Lanka for foreign employment. And the split is about 60% men and 40% women right now. But as you can see from the next slide, in much of the uh, foregone period, majority was female. These were female domestic workers going to the Gulf countries. And as you can see from this, a majority of them were housemates, female domestic housemates. And uh, there's a little bit of a trend where skilled workers are kind of coming up as of recent years. Um, right now, there were about, in 2013, there were 33% um, housemates out of the total number of um, workers who left Sri Lanka for employment. So as you can see, the uh, most prominent destination is Saudi Arabia in recent years, and moving on to remittances, which is very interesting about migration and development. We can see remittances has passed all the other foreign exchange earners in recent years and it stands out. When we look at the share of remittances in GDP, we see that almost 10% of the GDP, uh, remittances account for about 10% of the GDP. And as a share of export earnings also, we see that remittances hold a very good, decent place in Sri Lanka. Um, a couple of more facts. Um, the majority of the remittances in Sri Lanka are sent by individuals and uh, there's not much of group remittances coming like Sri Lankan associations or what the lady earlier said about the Ethio-German forum. That sort of um, organizations are not doing a lot yet in Sri Lanka. And um, considerable portion of the remittances are sent through informal channels. And when you look at the share of households that re receive remittances over 11% re of the households receive remittances in Sri Lanka. And roughly about one migrant for every five families in Sri Lanka. And when they go abroad for employment, they stay about two years at the destination. So now let's look at what is the impact of labor migration on development in Sri Lanka. So just um, to start off with, we know development is no longer only income growth, but it also encompasses um, the social well-being, especially of migrants, their families, and the entire society. So we look at migration and development from this holistic point of view. 
And also we can break this impact into the micro impact and the macro impact. So to start off with the micro impact, obviously we look at the migrant, the children, the spouse, and the caretaker of the children and the household unit. So uh, there are some positive implications of migration and also there are negative implications. To start off with some of the positive implications, as it was already mentioned, migra remittances are well targeted and it addresses the needs of the family or the household that receives and it helps to increase the household income and uh, improve the socioeconomic status of the household that receives remittances. And uh, in Sri Lanka we see that households that do receive remittances spend more on education and they spend more on health and nutrition. And also remittances, uh, not remittances, I mean the migration, the exposure to another country enhances the skills of the migrant. And also in the case of females, it also empowers the females because most of them were not employed before that and they didn't have such a voice um, even in term, in within the household. But despite these positive implications, when we look closely, we also see that there are some issues going on. So these improvements that I said that happens to a household in terms of um, increasing income or improving the socioeconomic status is often not lasting in Sri Lanka because most of the time, as it was already discussed, this remittances that comes in is spent on consumption sort of uh, activities. And also earlier it was raised that in Sri Lanka the education outcomes were not so good and then Radha, Dilip Radha was saying that he saw evidence that their uh, spending was more on tuition. I think what to how to reconcile that is, as Radha said, these households do spend on education when they do get remittances. But they, because of that, they might have access to better education. But when you look at the education outcomes, like Nisha did, we don't see a big impact on the education outcome, whether the student has really performed well because he got the remittances. So maybe he just went to a better tuition class, or had better books, read better textbooks. But outcome-wise, there hadn't been not much. Still, we have not seen so much gain from that angle. And also in terms of health. Uh, previously, it was said that uh, remittances improve the birth. Uh, children in remittance receiving household has high, had higher birth weights. And also there are other studies that have seen that um, about 25% of the children in remittance receiving households are still underweight. So still there is no consensus in Sri Lanka about the impact of uh, remittance and migration on development. So maybe more studies have to be done to see some converging of evidence. And also, I said that these migrants, when they go to another country, they do get exposed to other skills and experiences. But when they come back to Sri Lanka, there's a limited utility of these new skills that they have acquired because it's difficult to apply it directly in Sri Lanka and there's less opportunity to customize it and apply it in the context of Sri Lanka. And also, three, uh, another very critical thing when we look at the impact of migration on development is the vulnerability of migrants, the migrant themselves, especially female workers. I will get back to this later. And another point is the socioeconomic impact of migration on the children and the family left behind and the reintegration difficulties faced by migrants when they come back. So these three points I just want to delve a little bit more. When you look at uh, vulnerability of migrants, a recent study found that about 18% of the returnees have experienced some sort of abuse at destination. And uh, over about 50% have not had access to a telephone at work that limits their contact with the family at home. And also like 54% didn't have monthly leave when they were working abroad. And a big majority, 86% have said that their passports have been taken by the employer. So that, like, that limits their, uh, if they have a problem, that limits their possibility to go and complain about their problem if they don't have an identification at the destination. So that kind of ties down the migrant worker and puts him in a very bad situation at the destination country. So um, in addition, uh, also, it was discussed that these construction workers face a lot of difficulty. In Sri Lanka also there's lots of reports saying that these construction workers in the Middle East, they have to work under the scorching hot, hot sun in the summer days and they will get like very regimented bathroom breaks and limited water intake and they have to have their lunch exactly at the given time and standing in a line and they, when they go back they get very little rest and they are in like camp sort of 
situation. So when you look at development and migration, we also have to take a lot of consideration about the situation the migrant face at destination also. So moving on to a other issues, as I said, the majority of these people in the survey said they slept less than five hours a day. And other statistics show that about 95% of the complaints made by Sri Lankan workers abroad were by females. And because of this vulnerability that my workers um, endure, there's a huge emotional cost that minimizes their well-being as workers to them as well as to their families. And also there's a financial cost when the government tries to bring them down or pay compensation for what they have experienced. So these are some of the issues of migration on development. And looking at the psychosocial impact on the children left behind, we, this study found that about 23% um, of the females had children aged one to three years, and about 33 had children aged four to six years. So when a mother leaves, there's a huge impact on the children left behind, and that factors into the development impact on a country. And also, uh, this, an, another aspect was that, as I said earlier, about 25% of the children left behind were underweight because maybe there wasn't proper care arrangements for them. And so these things will affect the human capital generation in the country despite the impact of labor migration and remittances. And uh, also these children have more psych uh, psychosocial behavioral issues compared to children of non-migrant families. And also, as I said, they have low school performance in terms of outcome indicators and high dropout rates because there is no guidance, there is no proper like help with them, why are you not going to school, and that sort of pushing from a mother of figure or a father in some cases. And also, when you look at the left behind spouse, they also find it difficult, and it is a cost as well. There's, um, it's reported that uh, many of these left behind spouses, not only male, but also when the husband leaves, even a female has a lot of uh, difficulties raising, being a single parent and trying to cope up the household responsibility and being the household head. So there's a lot of depression among these left behind house spouses. And also it's reported that their average quality of life is uh, relatively lower than that of a non-migrant family spouse. And in terms of the caregivers, in Sri Lanka most of the time when a female migrant goes, it's the the grandparent who will take on the responsibility of childcare. And these uh, grandparents or grandmother is not, not fit to be ra raising a young kid. There's a lot of uh, involvement that is required, which is not possible for an older woman to give. So that puts a lot of physical and psychological stress on these caretakers. So these are also some of the implications that we have to look at when we look at the nexus between migration and development. And also when the migrant comes back, I said there are reintegration problems. So in, when it is labor migration, it's often temporary and there is definitely a returning of the migrants. So that we have to pre prepare for this return phase also. So in terms uh, of returning, Sri Lanka sees that many of these returnees find it difficult to find suitable employment after coming back. And uh, there is also very few opportunities for them to start a business or some self-employment activity in Sri Lanka at present or at the time of these surveys. And also they find it very difficult to reintegrate with the family and the society because they have changed values and exposure once they're outside. So it's difficult to seamlessly fit in back at home. So there is some time and there's a cost involved in that. So that was the micro side of it. When you look at the macro side of it, there's of course the brain drain, brain grain, and the employment issues, the <coughs> impact on investment and exports and trade balance. So when we take a close, closer look, in Sri Lanka we see that um, remittances is so massive that it cushions the trade deficit in Sri Lanka. So when we look, we can see that it's always, um, remittances is taking a big uh, responsibility of financing the trade deficit and in recent years it's just like almost 90% of the trade deficit. And in terms of um, savings, a large chunk of um, national savings can be attributed to be supported by remittances. I'm not saying that everything is from remittances, but remittances do support because when you look at the domestic savings, it's rather low, but national savings is, and investments are much higher. And also, um, 
there's this counter-cyclical nature of remittances which kind of helps the country, especially in the 2005 tsunami period, there was lots of remittances coming in to help the country. And also, when we look at um, the labor market in the country, right now uh, we don't have an exact estimate, but there's over one million Sri Lankans working outside. So if they were still in Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka would have to give them employment too. So it would have been a big challenge to find more jobs. And so uh, labor migration is kind of helping to keep the unemployment levels low in Sri Lanka. And also most of these females who go as um, female domestic workers have not been employed previously in Sri Lanka. So they were not in the labor force, but with this foreign employment opportunity, they're kind of brought into the labor force and the labor force participation is increased in Sri Lanka. And then we have the issue of brain gain, brain drain, and brain circulation. There is no proper evidence which way it's going on yet in Sri Lanka, but we do see that there's a considerable um, element of brain drain taking place. But we cannot say which outweighs um, to see the final effect of this brain drain, brain gain the, um, debate. So when we are to look at the net impact of migration on development, let's go back to what I said earlier. Earlier we, I said that most of the remittances are used as consumption, but when we look at from a development point of view, as I think Radha or the previous speaker already said, is it okay to say that uh, expenditure on health, food and medicine and housing can we call them non-development or are they not good investments? Because when you look at it from the point of view of the migrant, in their um, situation, in their circumstance, these are kind of good investments and it do contribute to the well-being of the family and it also creates multiplier effects. So in that sense, they do, despite being conspicuous consumption uh, behavior, they do impact the development of the country. And also when we look at the trade-off between the socio, uh, the, like the psychosocial cost of having a migrant parent and also the ability to access, be access better employment, uh, better education opportunities at, at, uh, while, my, while the parent is outside. We have to look at what's the trade-off, whether which way it's going to weigh, whether having better access is going to outweigh the absence of a parent. Also, th these things have to be considered in looking at the nexus between migration and development. And also, as I said, what is the net effect of brain drain and brain gain and circular, uh, brain circulation? So right now we do not have a proper idea about the real uh, effect of migration on development in Sri Lanka, but it looks promising for now. But what we see is that to maximize the positive effect of uh, migration on development, migration has to be mainstreamed so that um, it kind of, kind of uh, becomes a priority in all policy environment, all, all initiative, all, all development activities that's taken place in the country. So let's look at some of the institutional policy framework in Sri Lanka that helps this mainstreaming migration into development. So there are a couple of key pieces. The, f the main uh, institutional background in Sri Lanka for migration is the Sri Lanka Bureau of Foreign Employment, which does a regulatory function and an uh, agency function for foreign employment. And also there is this um, Association for Licensed Foreign Employment Agents. And also there's a government arm of foreign employment uh, agency where, which does recruitment for foreign employment. And in 2007, there was this um, ministry, dedicated ministry that was established called the Foreign Employment Promotion and Welfare Ministry. And under that, there is also the National Advisory Committee on Labor Migration. And also we have the National Labor Migration Policy of 2008. So I will spend a little time on the policy. One of the three components of this policy is linking migration to development. So I focus on this because that is the broad theme of this session. And uh, this policy is recognized that it's important to mainstream migration into development and uh, mainly it is done through four channels, the psychosocial well-being of migrants and their families, returnee, returnees and circular migration, engagement of transnational communities, that's the diaspora, and remittances. So just to go 
in detail into these four components that the Sri Lankan uh, policy focuses on. Uh, in terms of improving the well-being of the migrants, um, Sri Lanka has a lot of uh, activities going on at the pre-departure pre stage where migrants are given training and they are prepared to have a better outcome while they are at destination and also for, uh, to improve their reintegration possibilities upon returning. And also there is this um, Rata, a program called Rataviru, or the, the translation, uh, translated meaning is that foreign heroes, because they work overseas but they're heroes for the country. This is a grassroots level of, um, uh, intervention where there are organizations at all community levels which helps the migrants and their families at all stages like pre-migration pre stage, uh, during migration and also after returning for them to have better experience uh, in terms of migration. And also another example is uh, uh, the 2015 budget which prom uh, proposed a pension scheme for migrants to improve the well-being of the migrants. And in terms of uh, migrant families, there are some uh, two key things that I would like to bring out here. There are two uh, pieces of kind of policy or regulations that's going on. One is that female workers are not allowed to migrate if they have children less than five years of age. And another is that female requires to get the consent from a husband. From the point of view of the family well-being, these are very, very nice pieces. But then when we look at it, at it from the labor market point of view of the female worker, it's kind of discriminatory because a husband who has kids less than five, he doesn't, he's not um, stopped from going. He, a, a male could go even if he has young kids, but a woman is kind of restricted. And also the next one, if a female requires the consent from the husband, but the husband never has to give a consent, get a consent from the wife to migrate. So from the labor perspective, these are kind of discriminatory. Maybe these things can be tweaked or changed or looked more deeply when we look at the migration and development nexus. And also uh, Sri Lanka has these um, development officers who are working at grassroots levels to take a look at the welfare of the migrant families. And in terms of re reintegration, um, Sri Lanka has started focusing on reintegration very recently. And most of these programs are done through this Rata Virua program that I mentioned already. In terms of circular migration and diaspora, despite these two has, have been identified as key components for this, um, there's not much that has been done yet and often circular migrants are disappeared between temporary migrants and permanent migrants and they have not been focused properly to take the maximum benefit out of circular migrants into development. And also in terms of diaspora, due to historical and political issues, Sri Lanka is still not able to harness the full potential of diaspora into development. So that's what's going on in terms of those two. And in terms of remittances, the policy targets to reduce the cost of remittances and widen the choice of formal channels for remittances and achieve a higher mix of skilled migrants so that the remittances can be improved, especially that is tried through securing more employment opportunities for skilled workers and providing accessible and widespread opportunities to become skilled workers like training programs and opportunities to become people to improve their skills before they depart. And also in the 2015 budget, there, has been, there was a proposal to entice more remittances to give a tax concession of to, up to 60% of remittances for people to get a duty-free vehicle. So that is what has been done in terms of remittances and there's a target of reaching about 10, million, 10 billion US dollars by 2016. Um, so finally, this is my last slide. So Sri Lanka is uh, relying heavily on migration for development, but Sri Lanka is also very cautious that remittances are pri uh, private household transfers and they should not be considered as substitute for overseas development aid or FDI. And also Sri Lanka notes that foreign employment cannot be a major strategy to sustain economic development and achieve national development goals in the long run. So with that idea, only Sri, Lanka's go, Sri Lanka goes ahead with this uh, migration and development nexus and using migration for development in Sri Lanka. So that's all from me. I think I'm right on time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bilesha.
Um, I got the message from the organizers that in order to save some time we have to be practical and um, have to shift our question and answer session or mix it with our tea break. So the idea is that we have a final summary from our discussion to Irudaya Rajan and afterwards a pity for for Binod Khadria, uh, unfortunately not to be with us for the tea break. Binod, if you can hear us, I hope you, I hope you for your understanding, but um, this is the way we have to do it because of um, the other sessions coming up afterwards as well. So please, Irudaya, let us have your comments and um, <coughs> please try to keep it as short as possible. Let's agree on a maximum of 10 minutes. Yeah, let us see. <coughs> let us see. Let us see, because in fact, uh, <coughs> I just want to start talking about, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, in this seminar, I'm happy that they have a session on migration development. I think this is something very important. And second thing is that uh, when I heard yesterday the uh, former Deputy Chairman Planning Commissioner of Government of India, not even a single discussion on migration. I think uh, it is important, it is very important that we should talk about migration as, as one of the development agenda and also for jobs. We are talking about jobs for whom? We are also talks people moving the country, moving out of the country, within the country. So I thought something important and I thought I'm very happy to be part of this because uh, uh, this seminar, I think I should thank Ali for having this session on migration development. I think this is, I thought it will go without that. And of course, yesterday, Peter rightly asked the planning, board, planning commission vice chairman. And that is, the, that is what the re recent thing is, what you can talk about migration into the policy. Even the policy makers are not recognizing migration, how important this for development. I think with this one, I am and I'm not going to discuss the paper by Dilip or uh, Binod Katriya or our, uh, our friend from Sri Lanka, I want you to give you some idea on a uh, little bit on India and I want to take you to the experience of 20 years of migration in Kerala and what it tells you so that you can uh, learn from that experience of the migration development. So I will be quick on that. Now, uh, I am going to give you something on India's youth. For example, yesterday we had a long discussion on youth, but none of them were discussing about migration there because if you take, I will I'll show you some data. So I want to talk about a little bit on youth and something about facts about internal migration. We know very little about internal migration in this country. Everybody, if you ask sitting, all of the people sitting here from India, all of them are migrants. But we never discuss so seriously on uh, internal migration and remittances probably I leave it and then I'll go to the Kerala experience. And uh, this is the proportion of youth to the total population of India today, 29%. We are talking about 15 to 29. These are the migration prone age group. That means these are the, what we talk about demographic dividend and it will decline. This is very important. This dividend will not be with us for a long time. It is only 20 years. For example, state like Kerala, that there is no dividend now. The dividend was there uh, 30 years back. So when you talk about India as a country, uh, you know, we should talk about like Europe. You have Europe 29 small, small pieces. You have European Union. We have small, small pieces. We have 35 states. So I think Kerala is almost over. So when you talk about the demographic dividend, it's only for a few years and it is already on the decline. And you can see that by the number. Today we have 350 million people who are currently 15 to 29 and it will go up to 400. That's it. That's the end of the, the whole demographic dividend. And we are talking about here 15 to 29, because I'm talking about youth. They are the migration brown age group. We have no skills already told by Binod uh, Katriya, because all of them are mostly we have uh, unskilled, less than 10, 10 class fail and pass and things like that. And look at the migration data which you have from 2001. 2011 has not come, but uh, we have some understanding of what the number likely to look like. We have 315 million people who are internally migrating in India as per the 2001 census. Out of that, 29% of them are youth. I think this is very important. We have to discuss youth and migration in a larger context. And if you look at more, why we are not even still talking, look at this map generated from the 2007 8 uh, NSSO data on internal migrant per 100 households. You see, it is happening throughout the country. And we talk sometimes in only political terms. 
in, in Maharashtra, for exa example, they discuss about internal migration, people don't want them to come to uh, Bombay and other things. But then you look at that, the whole north is completely internal migrant, you can see that. But still we are not putting into the policy debate, I think which is, which is very sad uh, in Indian context. And I can imagine that if it is the case for internal migration, can you imagine the international migration which is not prevalent throughout the country? Look at the NSSO data on international migrants. It is not there much. You see only small patches in this country, not like uh, internal migration. So they are not neglecting internal migration. Then you can imagine what will happen in the international migration. Of course, uh, we have a ministry which is talking about international migration here, but I will discuss a little bit on later. Now, why we should talk about uh, migration important? Because the age distribution of migrants, most of them are young. We talk about return migrant after 40. So I think this migration prone age group, can we provide skills for them to reasonably migrate and get uh, income back? I think that's why I thought we should talk about age distribution of migrants. And uh, something on estimates right now. We have approximately 400 million internal migrant in this country because Last census that 30% of them are internal migrants. That means we are talking about 400 million people moving within the country and we have no policy. In fact, we have an Interstate Migration Act, which is, I always call them like a, it's like a paper tiger. You see the tiger, but it's only paper. So we don't be a fear about them. So we have the Migration Act, which is almost like a paper. And we have international migrants, we have 14 million, but please remember, seven millions are in the six countries in the Gulf. Six countries in the Gulf holding seven million of Indians, uh, UAE, uh, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Bahrain, Oman, and Kuwait. So I think we have to look at it, India and Gulf corridor, which is also a big corridor like India or Bangladesh. And seven millions are other than the Gulf. Anywhere, you can talk about 189 countries, students, which is coming a very important student migration. And of course, India is number one in remittances, which I will not talk much because already uh, Dilip spoke about that. And this is something which I would like to tell you because why you should know about Kerala is that currently the